Welcome, everyone. The Center of Excellence in Smart Construction is pleased to present this virtual seminar, Natural-Based Solutions as Climate Action Strategies in the Built Environment. My name is Dr. Wendu Oguda, and I'm the manager at the Center of Excellence in Smart Construction. Please note, we are recording this webinar and all lines are muted. If you need help at any time, please send us a message via the Q&A chat box. Today's event will last up to 60 minutes. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the event. Simply type them into the Q&A chat box in the lower center of the screen, and then be sure to click the send button. The Center of Excellence in Smart Construction is committed to advancing industry-led innovations in the built environment that will revolutionize the way we develop, manage, and operate smarter cities. The center partners with like-minded organizations and government entities to lead the transformation of the built environment and development of next generation of professionals for the benefit of the economy. The center is a global hub for disruptive thinking, a platform for collaborative research, a model for solutions development and stakeholder engagement. The center's industry-led research and development has a focus on enabling technologies around three main research themes, performance and productivity, sustainability, and well-being. The collaboration is intended to provide leadership in the future direction of the industry that will inform policy decision makers. We would like to acknowledge our five industry partners who have been integral to the development of the center and their engagement with industry. We would also like to acknowledge our ongoing relationships with our affiliates, and our ongoing relationship with our strategic alliances. It's now my pleasure to introduce our esteemed industry experts. Dr. Michael Lacasse is a senior research officer in the Construction Research Center of the National Research Council, Canada, having over 30 years experience as a building engineer. For the last decade, he has acted as a team leader to the Facade Systems and Products Group at the National Research Council Construction. He's a member of the board of the International Council for Research and Innovation and Building and Construction, CIB, which includes being the coordinator for CIB TG97 on nature-based solutions for resilient buildings and communities. More recently, he supported the work of the National Building Code of Canada Standing Committee on Environmental Separation, and also worked on the Canadian Standards Association Committee to revise the standard CSA S478 guideline on durability in buildings. He also participated in ASTM activities of committee E06 and performance of buildings. Prior to working at the NRC, Dr. Lacasse worked both in private industry and government construction agencies. Reem Ayagu is a green urbanization manager at Polypipe Middle East with a massive interest in natural based drainage solutions from green brew roof, rooftops to bioretentions and rain drainings for the built environment. Reem has comprehensive technical experience in the design of infrastructure systems and water management. She's an accredited green roof professional from the Living Architecture Academy and the lead green associate from the US Green Building Council, which assists in understanding and achieving designers goals and clients visions of having sustainable, resilient and healthy green spaces. Reem has a master's degree in engineering management and a bachelor's degree in civil engineering, which has enabled her to work closely with consultant firms and governmental and private developers to support them with innovative solutions 
and also publishing various technical papers related to the built environment and construction challenges. Tasneem Bakri is Assistant Manager of Operations at Alpine Limited. She has a master's degree in architecture engineering and aspirations of becoming a leading voice in the local and international green building community. She is a well plus lead accredited professional, a well faculty member and master down faculty member. Tasnim's primary professional interest lies in the human factor of the built environment with a special focus on biophilic design, nature incorporation through well principles and monitoring features of the built environment that have a direct impact upon health, human health and well-being. I'll now hand you over to our moderator for the webinar, Dr. Michael Lacasse. Michael, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Wendu. I really appreciate uh, uh, the introduction and uh, welcome to uh, the panelists. Uh, and here's a unique opportunity to talk about nature-based solutions. Um, now, my uh, association with nature-based solutions uh, started uh, perhaps a, a couple of years ago in association with my colleagues at the Concordia University, where we uh, put together a, um, uh, a proposal for uh, collaboration amongst uh, uh, other universities in Canada to seek out nature-based solutions um, for uh, urban agglomerations that, are, that are, are located across Canada. Well, we weren't successful, but uh, we didn't wish to uh, stop there and leave everything to, uh, uh, to others to do. And so um, uh, being involved in uh, CIB and the International Council for Research and Innovation and Building Construction, uh, I suggested that we uh, develop a, um, a task group on nature-based solutions for climate resilient buildings and communities, which we did. And we had our first inaugural meeting um, in October of uh, last year. And we have a three-year mandate and we're, we are, our intent is to uh, bring practitioners, research practitioners uh, together, those that uh, develop the solutions and those who implement them uh, for urban agglomerations. And uh, because, well, for the most part, we found that uh, in Canada, in any case, it's landscape architects that play the largest role in uh, providing these solutions, whereas uh, building engineers are just learning about how these solutions may affect buildings and reduce the uh, urban heat island effects. And, and likewise, by, uh, by extension, um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from those buildings, perhaps. The question is, we don't have any metrics to be able to do the proper design. And right now, a lot of it is simply conjecture. And so our mission is to develop guidelines for building practitioners that they can use that would allow them proper metrics by which to design, be they landscape architects, be they building engineers, be they involved in all of that. And so uh, I invite you to uh, have a look at, uh, at uh, the website on, uh, at CIB, CIBTG97, one link simply to uh, locate that. We have two panelists with us uh, today, and perhaps Reem is going to talk to us about uh, green roofs, I don't know. Uh, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, blue-green roofs are uh, de rigueur in Norway. And uh, I recently adjudicated a PhD thesis uh, of someone who was talking about their blue-green roof, which I, I have to admit, I didn't know much about, but I found out a lot about it but in, uh, in reading the thesis. So I. I, I welcome uh, I welcome this uh, I welcome the panelists and I, I think we're going to have a very good time with it today. Thank you so much. Please go ahead, Ring. Thank you, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, well, actually, thank you so much, um, uh, Center of Excellence and Smart Construction, for giving us the opportunity to be, be here. And uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen for the presentation. Um, is it is it shared? Can you just please confirm? Okay, great. So um, our topic today is about nature-based solutions as a climate action strategies and the built environment. 
Um, as we usually say, identify the problem um, basically is 50% of uh, knowing the solution. So uh, it's what it's worth. Um, it's it's worth to take a few seconds and to remind ourselves of the source of the problem to elaborate the solutions further. So at first, and I know 90% of the world population might know this by knowing. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, sorry, uh, just the scroll down. So um, yeah, again, um, we know basically like 90% of the population now know uh, the word uh, climate change and they know uh, the word of the climate action. So basically what's the climate action is and why it's urgent matter. Climate action is goal 13 on the list of uh, UN sustainable developing goals, meaning to take urgent actions, combat climate change and its impact. Uh, humans increasingly influencing uh, the climate and the earth temperature by burning fossil fuels, cutting down forests and farming livestock. This adds enormous amount of the greenhouse gases to those naturally occurring in the atmosphere, increasing the greenhouse gases effects and global warming. The impact of change in climate is increasingly evident in our cities as the flooding extended periods of drought and excessive heat combined to create public health emergency. Policymakers have begun to wake up to the scale of the challenge uh, facing our urban environment and necessity to create resilient cities that adapt um, the changing climate. Um, anyway, just localizing the talk a little bit about uh, UAE and um, you know, scaling it to that limit. Climate change impacts increase national sensitivity and if left unmanaged, will affect the growth potential of the UAE. Potential impacts of climate change um, include extreme heat, uh, storm surge, sea level rise, as we see nowadays in Abu Dhabi, uh, water stress, even dust and sandstorms, uh, and, and for sure desertification. Even small variation in the weather uh, pattern could significantly affect the country's economic, environmental, and social well-being. But what about the biodiversity part and why it is important? Biodiversity is on, not only one of the most vital features of our planet, but it's also one of the most complex. Uh, biodiversity refers to every single form of life on Earth, uh, from animals, plants, fungi, right down to the ecosystems in which they reside. Uh, climate change is impacting wildlife, as we all know nowadays, contributing to the rapid loss of biodiversity um, that we are witnessing nowadays as well. Uh, so uh, basically we have two interwent crises, which is the uh, loss of biodiversity as well as the climate change crisis. Alternating Earth's capacity to sequester and store the carbon we emit while removing the opportunities our uh, societies to adapt the new climate tech uh, normal that we all know nowadays. So what are the nature-based uh, solutions we would like to talk about today? Um, Basically, central to the contemporary thinking is the concept of nature-based solutions, which harness the benefits of nature and urban environments to address these societal changes, while at the same time providing a human well-being and biodiversity effects. Um, the term nature-based solutions refer to sustainable management and use of natural features and processes to tackle social environmental challenges. We all know these challenges for sure. Uh, these challenges are the climate change, water security, water pollution, uh, human health, biodiversity loss, and uh, for sure, the disaster risk management. Uh, just to look how locally we adapted such solutions. We have the mangroves farms, for example, in Abu Dhabi, and the utilization of the green spaces in Dubai. Because of their ability to sequester carbon, one of the major of mangroves is their ability to reduce harmful greenhouse gases, which causes climate change, obviously. They, they basically convert these, ground, these greenhouses gas into organic carbon, um, which is either released into the surrounding sediments or uh, used to build the complex root structures. Um, at the same time, under the uh, a Green Dubai uh, plan, which is the 2040 plan, recreational spaces um, 
recreation spaces and green spaces are dedicated uh, all, all, and doubled in size everywhere. And um, natural reserves and rural natural areas will, con will constitute 60% of the Emirates' total area. Several green corridors will be established to link these service areas and, you know, uh, basically to establish these working places. Um, and just back to the importance of these green spaces, uh, for sure they can absorb storm water runoff, um, reduce urban heat island effects, lower drought impacts and remove carbon, um, which is like basically things that uh, we work day by day, we, we take them for granted. But after formalizing ourselves with day-to-day -day natural based solution, we will now look at some technicalities of use. Natural based solution either be used at macro level, which is city, city scale, uh, such as open green spaces, river streams, urban forests, uh, green corridors maybe, or even at the micro, microscopic level, which is neighborhood scale, for example, uh, urban farming, retention ponds, bioretention areas, even green roofs and uh, green walls, which can be taken as a building scale level. Um, actually, while searching, uh, I found it something interesting, which is the uh, the long game concept. Um, basically, this long game concept referring to the sustainability side of the natural best solution and long life impacts they have on the built environment, showing how the adaptation can reduce the global peak temperature and suppress warming, uh, especially uh, like uh, two to three Celsius degrees by uh, 2100 a uh, year. Um, so integrating natural based solution for urban resilience. Natural based solutions challenge the traditional uh, collect, transport, release method of urban water management, which failed to recognize the importance of water and push problems downstream. Urban environments make extensive use of hard impermeable surfaces, which have practical function, but which serve to interrupt the nature of water cycle and increase the surface runoff, which is around 95% of rainfall. So restoring this natural water cycle is essential if we want to repair our relationship with water. Um, it's often said sometimes that the nature finds a way and that's really indeed something factual we see nowadays, um, especially even the Gulf region. And if left to its own devices, nature would take over our cities, our urban areas, and everywhere in between. Of course, allowing this happen wouldn't be um, something practical in the modern cities. So um, putting in mind a new generation of infrastructure projects that harness the power of nature can help achieve the development goals, including uh, water and nature relationship. We all know this rule, which is the no green without the blue. So green infrastructure and making space for water to create these important green spaces is what we should put in mind. Sustainable drainage isn't just for convenience of rainwater, but it's for reporting it for sure. As we move further into new area of urbanization, uh, our cities face accumulated distresses and sudden shock risks. And this is what we saw now, for example, in Oman and Kuwait. The development of land trying to accommodate more and more people into our cities and ignoring climate change could result in greater physical, social, as well as economical changes. But now there is some, something kind of like a disconnection between uh, having no technical solution or low technical or even high technical solution. Um, so urbanization and extreme weather require smarter urban water management and nature-based solutions like vegetated roof and city trees um, can contribute effectively to, uh, sorry, uh, maybe I lost the uh, share. Okay. Uh, just a second, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. So, um, urbanization and extreme weather required. 
So uh, urbanization and extreme weather requires smarter urban water management and nature-based solutions like vegetated roofs and city trees can contribute effectively to climate resilience and future-proof urban water management. However, large-scale implementation is limited due to lack of knowledge among professionals uh, on how to capture, store, and reuse water on site. Uh, more developed high-tech green solutions have vegetation performing uh, even beyond natural capacities, offering full water management control options and enable city planners, architects, landscape designers to enhance urban resilience and circularity without claiming valu valuable urban spaces. Um, Basically, in order to implement such innovative solutions in the Gulf region, a research gap should be closed. And that's what Polypipe is doing currently with the Center of Excellence and Smart Construction, uh, which is a collaborative research work to investigate the implementation of natural-based solutions, such as the green-blue uh, roofs that um, uh, Professor Michael just mentioned, and its effect on the building's roof and podium decks in the hot areas. The area of the research will cover the local needs and standards to overcome conventional challenges. Uh, focusing on nature-based solutions will not to only help to maintain healthy ecosystems, but it will also assist with the restoration of damaged habitats, basically within the built up areas. In turn, this will provide a number of benefits, both to human and uh, the environment overall. Um, just to finalize things up, uh, I will leave you with a case study uh, for one of the green roofs in August Strindberg. Uh, a city of Malamo. Uh, local stakeholders and residents motivated the project initiated uh, by the city of Malamo, as I mentioned. Diverse financing sources help the project, which is something um, that actually can characterize, can characterize this uh, kind of projects. Um, um, having this, the financing source from uh, European uh, uh, funds, public nation budgets, public local authorities, uh, as well as cooperative investments. It was one of the pioneering projects in technical natural based solution and energy solution. Um, just uh, sorry to interrupt, I apologize, but uh, you're, how should I say the sharing of the slides is no longer. And so we're not going through, uh, you're not going through the, the, the list of slides that you've had for us. Uh, so it's, it's not, uh, okay. Uh, we can see something on the screen. It's just that you're not going through your, the set of slides uh, that you've prepared. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Sorry so you, about that. you want to unshare and share again. Uh huh, maybe yes. Uh, what about now? Is it good? Uh, not any, well, because no, it's okay. not any better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sorry, technicality issues like all over the place always. Um, I will try again. Uh, maybe this time happened anything? Nothing. Still? No, we're still, <laughs> we're still on the solving the problem with innovative solutions. <laughs> Slide yeah. Uh, what about now? Maybe. No, nothing now. N nothing now. Okay. Uh, okay. Ah. Ian, maybe I can try and share it from my side. Uh, maybe now change a little bit. Yes, yes, it works. Okay, now. great. Uh, apologize good. for that. Apology for this. <laughs> Not to worry about it. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, again, just to recap a little bit, um, as we mentioned before, uh, Focusing on nature-based solutions will not only help to maintain healthy ecosystems, but it also assists with the restoration of damaged habitats, uh, basically within the built-up areas. In turn, this will provide uh, a number of benefits, both for human environment. And here, just to finalize things up, uh, this is a case study I read about uh, for one of the green groups in uh, Oaken Sternberg, uh, basically where stakeholders and local stakeholders and residents motivated the project and initiated by the city of Malamo. Um, 
uh, the the good thing about or let's say the what's special about this project that all of the uh, funding was locally and happened through uh, European uh, fundings um, as well as public authority budget and corporate investments just to show the importance of the green spaces and how it's important to to have green uh, spaces and roofs. Uh, basically, it increased the biodiversity by 50% and reduced the uh, carbon dioxide by 20%. At the same time, initiated um, uh, working force by uh, 30%. Thank you so much for listening, and that's it, really. Thank you. Reem, thank you very much uh, for that. R really appreciate it. Uh, but, uh, how shall I say? Unfortunately, someone. Uh, decided not to mute their uh, a microphone and so uh, there was uh, there was someone who wasn't as agree agreeing with you as uh, as, uh, as the rest of us had uh, so in any case uh, very very good indeed and so uh, uh, so now we, we have uh, the questions are open to the panelists that would be myself and uh, Tasneem. Tasneem have you uh, have you any questions for Reem? Thank you so much Reem. Um... I was actually going to ask uh, about the blue, uh, the blue green roof that you mentioned, which is really interesting. I was wondering if uh, you've encountered any integrations of that, uh, whether in the Middle East or. Uh, basically, uh, green roofs now in the Middle East are uh, growing. Uh, in back in 2015, uh, there was lots of studies and lots of uh, talk about the green roofs. But unfortunately, due to the lack of the, um, let's say, parameters and the standards and um, uh, the, uh, let's say, the local and um, uh, codes and municipality control, there was, you know, uh, no clear guidance for them to uh, have them uh, more often. Uh, so. Um, Recently, um, due to the adaptation of the uh, European codes and the uh, adaptation of uh, more guidance from um, uh, um, more experienced, let's say, professionals, now we have them uh, back in the region and in the projects. Uh, for example, in Abu Dhabi, like most of the projects, uh, we can see they are adapting green roofs everywhere, and as well as uh, the uh, blue green roofs, which is uh, as uh, Dr. Me Michael just mentioned, which is something new and adapted in the region, and that's what we are studying now, um, currently. Ah, and so, so here's a question for you. You say we're studying now, but where? So where are the studies being done, uh, and, and uh, who's been doing them? I'm very curious about it because I I don't know too many people who focus on blue green roofs. So I'm uh, I'm curious about all of this, of course. And of course, uh, well, a little background. Well, I'll let you answer the question first, and then I'll go get a little more information myself. Please go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, uh, only studies were about the green roofs were about, uh, or let's say, resulted from modeling aspects. Uh, you know, huh. just uh, yeah, uh, only modeling. But that's the gap that we want to close with the Center of Excellence Smart Construction. We want to close this gap. We want to provide the clear guidance on how to have these clear uh, blue green roofs, not only green roofs, in the Middle East uh, through um, uh, will bring uh, will a uh, clear guidance uh, at the same time. Uh, professional guides and not just like uh, any kind of adapting local codes and um, uh, let's say standards uh, been adapted um, uh, through Europe and uh, all global. Yes, I quite understand. Well, okay, so the, the uh, I had mentioned earlier at, at Tasneem that uh, I'd been involved in a PhD defense where the, the focus was on blue green roofs. The, the, um, the idea, of course, and this is out of Norway, uh, Trondheim, actually, the work and at uh, NTNU. And uh, the reason that they have blue-green roofs in, in Norway is to uh, mitigate the effects of, uh, of extreme rain events that apparently they're getting more of, uh, so that uh, those events don't cause flooding in urban areas, because otherwise the water would not be retained as it would be in a pool above uh, a roof or on a roof. And uh, and go down to the uh, so the you know roof uh, water runoff from intense rain events uh, 
uh, it does apparently cause flooding in, in certain locales uh, in Norway. So that's what this blue-green roof is all about. Mind you, uh, having a blue-green roof uh, in a, an arid country is something altogether different. And so I'm curious to know, I'm curious to know, uh, I mean, you know, uh, given that there are not intense rainfalls, what's the, what would be the purpose of having a, a, a blue-green roof in an arid country? Well, uh, green blue roofs doesn't look only about, or let's say, doesn't only have a rain, um, a rainwater source as the only source. No, but uh, basically, blue roofs has much more than this. Not only to accommodate uh, 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 stormwater events. No, uh, but for sure, the Gulf region is a whole different strategies, a whole different climate we are dealing with. So, uh, a whole different parameters. Um, but what can distinguish it from European countries and um, other than stormwater events, the high use of acid condensate, the, the high use of PSA treated water, and all of these, um, such as treating water, have um, further implication, implications such as CO2 emissions. And basically, you know, treating all of that water uh, can uh, be, you know, a cost, uh, co yeah, can, can need high cost and uh, well, very interesting high that emissions, is. yes. Hadn't, so, uh, hadn't occurred to me, but it's very good. Yes, yes. So instead of just uh, putting all this water, uh, such as AC condensate, anti ac 3 or water, to the main infrastructure and treating it again, no, we can have it at source. It right on the then, Exactly. And that's then reuse it for the green urbanization. Okay, that, that, yeah. that makes all sorts of sense. So, uh, exactly. Yes. So, gray, gray water cleansing. Yes, on the exactly. This is, this is, this is, uh, this is inspired, I must say. I like this idea. Okay. <laughs> well, but you don't have a, li a live uh, laboratory on which to try all of these ideas, I ideas out. And you say you do a lot of it uh, by simulation. What types of simulation do you use? Uh, basically, these simulations focus on the uh, heat indices, uh, heat impacts indices, uh, where basically we have, uh, for example, the gray roof as a standard point. Uh, we look at them, how they absorb heat and how they produce CO2 and uh, all of these gas emissions and the impact on the uh, you know, urban heat island effect uh, eventually. And what if we covered all of these areas, the gray areas with the green uh, spaces? So the simulation all differ and uh, the results differ at the same time. And that's where the innovative happens uh, where you can see, uh, you know, through modelization and visualization that the green spaces can really have a great impact on reducing the urban heat island effect. But we are looking nowadays, as I mentioned, uh, to have a trail uh, on the top of the roof, and uh, we hope one day you can visit us and see it. <laughs> uh, very good indeed. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Tasneem, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, actually, this is really interesting, uh, especially the part where it solves uh, multiple problems and issues uh, just by incorporating the green roof. Um, as, as Reem mentioned, sometimes the, uh, the driver of this, uh, whether in the Middle East or anywhere else, would be to have clear guidance on how to uh, design and implement. Um, sometimes you find projects that have the, the sufficient funding for something like a green roof. It's only about the guidance and finding the correct um, advisors or, or designers and consultants, and even someone who would um, basically take your hand through the process with uh, the, the suppliers. So in terms of understanding the benefits of it, this is something that I believe uh, currently we're raising awareness about it and uh, uh, we're seeing the increased awareness on, um, on the interest in nature-based solutions in general and green roofs in specific. Yeah, I would uh, I would add to that as well. I, I quite agree. It's the, the issue. That, so one of the uh, out of this out of the discussion from this PhD thesis was uh, exactly this point: is that uh, there are no guidelines, and clearly there's a, a great need for them. And so every time there's a, a live laboratory that from which one can extract useful information to help develop guidelines, that's very useful. And then, you know, are, is there any other way of doing it? when you're actually, really what you need to see is how the implementation is, because of course we can all, uh, we can all on paper, or actually, pardon me, uh, I, 
as that dates me a bit, doesn't it? Uh, but uh, we can all uh, design something. <laughs> <laughs> we can all design something, but uh, it's all in its implementation, in particular when it comes to um, structures such as blue green uh, roofs, which uh, for which, of course, one doesn't want to have rain fall in the building. And so uh, rather an important consideration. Uh, but so having said that, um, uh, why, well, having said that, it's uh, it, it perhaps it'd be worthwhile considering uh, as we develop guidelines uh, for pra practical guidelines for working together, what what needs to uh, perhaps that might be a very good case study of developing guidelines for blue green roofs or or green roofs in general. I know that uh, where I work at the National Research Council, we have a uh, a research program focused entirely on uh, nature based solutions. And one of the subtasks is green roofs and blue green roofs, and so yeah, uh, yeah. so I and <laughs> yeah. and so I, I would invite both of you to uh, to uh, to help us uh, figure all of that out. I'll invite <laughs> no, uh, definitely both not. of you to uh, CIB Task Group ninety seven to participate in that because I think you'd have much to add, and we could have a special uh, subgroup. Uh, that uh, would help develop uh, guidelines for for roofs or resilient roofs. So I think that uh, in which you would you would both participate, of course, I would hope. So I think that would be a very positive thing. Yeah. And also one one more thing to add. So in terms of the nature based solutions, when we talk about green roofs, we're t I mean, we're only talking about one of the um, many solutions we have that are nature-based and that can uh, combat climate change. So as Reem mentioned, there's a lot of uh, other uh, strategies and features that can be focused on uh, to look at climate change, like the concept of biodiversity um, and, and many other solutions that actually do have the, guide, the, the, the enough guidance that you would uh, find in international green building rating systems um, and even in local uh, governmental uh, uh, strategies and, and policies that are actually established. So it's, it's not always about um, focusing on that one part that we're not able right now to, to implement, but actually we do have a lot uh, that many people can actually contribute to and, and should contribute to in terms of climate change. So the concept of biodiversity, this is well established in international green building uh, rating systems. Um, so similar to the LEED uh, rating system and well uh, rating system, they both uh, touch on the subjects of biodiversity, protecting habitats, um, all the actions that uh, projects can actually implement and uh, uh, in this way, we are only combating or reducing our uh, uh, climate change impact. Thank you very much. I think we're, we're going to uh, go to uh, answering, uh, we're into the Q&A uh, portion of the, uh, of the webinar right now. And so there are a few questions and I wanna thank uh, those people who are attending uh, to uh, thank you for your questions up to now. And, and uh, if you have, and, and continue sending them in please. So, Here's one uh, from uh, Noor Habib. Uh, it says, uh, he says, I'm very much interested in green roof. A roof. Uh, is it produced by nature-based materials? And so, uh, very, what, so perhaps one of you could uh, describe uh, what a green roof is all about. Um, either of you. Uh, Please go ahead, Reem. You 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 know about. Uh, I'll Reem. let yeah. I'll let Reem go ahead with. Uh, Please go ahead, Reem. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the installation of the green roof is simple as any green space, but in let's say a uh, simpler way even. Um, all you need to to have just a growing medium with uh, let's say um, uh, green uh, green layer and. Um, the technicality part is within the drainage system and the, the insulation. 
So um, in both uh, in in these both parameters, the insulation as well as the drainage, if they are adequate enough, then you can guarantee a good uh, let's say green roof with addition to have an appropriate ground medium to that suitable to, uh, for the adaptable uh, green um, area or space that you have or let's say spaces. Um, at the same time, green roofs varies. Uh, they might be. Um, um, let's say um, intensive green roofs uh, they might be um, these intensive green roof uh, can have various species and uh, different depth of uh, growing medium there's uh, purple green roofs as well with different species at the same time with but different applications so uh, green roofs is a huge word and uh, if you want to, to talk about it now we can't actually finish uh, in a simple period of time but uh, yeah, it's, it's as simple as any green space, but with the limited technicalities, and that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Reem. We have another uh, uh, anonymous uh, qu uh, a question from an anonymous individual. Um, and here's the question Do you agree that nature based solutions could lead to green washing as they obscure the real problems of climate change? <laughs> and either of you had a, any answer to that question? I'm sorry, Michael, can you please repeat the question? Absolutely. It says, do you agree that nature-based solutions could lead to green washing as they obscure the real problems of climate change? All right, um, so this is actually part of what I was just saying that we don't need to focus on maybe one item or one action, and then uh, we completely uh, stay ignorant or uh, uh, ignore the other actions that we can do in terms of climate change. So the focus on green roof is great because you're looking at something that's achievable uh, with the correct guidance that can support, but it's not, I wouldn't um, call it greenwashing unless we are completely ignoring all other efforts. So the, the, the main focus here is for us to uh, look at the, the efforts collectively. So if we are, uh, if you're an individual, you would find certain actions that you can actually contribute. Um, and it could be from volunteering and um, beach cleaning activities, it could be reducing your own energy usage, uh, water consumption usage. So focusing on all the aspects where you can contribute to climate change and even for organizations. Let's say you're focusing on having a green roof, but at the same time, you're not only combating climate change, you're focusing on human health and well-being. Of course, the benefits of having nature-based solutions. So it, I wouldn't necessarily call it uh, greenwashing unless uh, we are completely focusing on one aspect, which is not the case. Thank you very much. I have another question here from Ian Patterson from the UK. And he says, uh, thank you very much for a good presentation. It's very interesting to learn about nature-based solutions in Dubai. My work focuses on the flood benefits of nature-based solutions, mainly in the UK. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the drought water scarcity reduction benefits of nature-based solutions? Any, any of you, any of you can answer any of this. Yeah, well, actually, you know, um, basically uh, using the other sources of water, as mentioned, yes, we are in water scarcity regions, but using alternative sources of water such as AC condensate, AC treated water, or even in gray water can increase, uh, increase and utilizing them in um, uh, green spaces and as a part of natural based solution can help as well to have um, greater uh, precipitation percentage, which at the same time can increase the rainfall events. And thus just accommodating the natural cycle and adapting, adapting it once again. So yes, natural based solution can basically help to decrease um, the uh, Desertification can decrease the um, being just water uh, scarcity region and uh, for sure the drought seasons. Yeah. And if I may add, uh, Reem, if you allow me to add here, so uh, one of the aspects 
that actually uh, we focus on in the Middle East or in, in hot climate conditions in general is that one, when we promote um, vegetation or uh, including green roofs or vegetation with the newer built uh, environment, we also focus on the concept of using native species. Mm. So uh, specifically because of the problem of uh, water scarcity and to reduce the water consumption and the need for irrigation. Of um, so this is one uh, aspect in which it's adapted uh, in the Middle East. Uh, because we place a huge focus on using native uh, native species. Makes perfect sense, of course. Uh, that's right. So when in implementing nature-based solutions, it's always good to have someone who knows a little something about uh, the vegetation selection of vegetation. Uh, here yeah. in North America, a civiculturist is uh, is uh, having a civiculturist or someone who's uh, who's who's been working in the forest industry is, is always useful, but uh, here's another question by from Anita Chairman. She says, uh, in your opinion, does adoption and implementation of blue-green roof roofs depend on the decisions of professionals, uh, such as an architect uh, or key decision makers, or does it depend on policy making, laws, and guidelines? Any thoughts on that? I would say it's, uh, of course, a little bit of both. It requires everyone's um, adoption of the idea, um, the agreement of everyone uh, in regards to the concept of climate change and what we need to do to combat climate change. So if let's say you have a certain project, and this is actually part of uh, what we do as Alpine Limited as a sustainability consultancy. We work on projects to um, help the project team in achieving the sustainable features in their projects. So we often find that the decision to, to take any sustainable uh, feature into consideration in a project is not always a, a decision of one uh, individual. It needs that integrated process. So uh, from, from the project owner to the designers to the contractors, you need everyone's um, green light let's say so that uh, you make sure <laughs> yeah yes uh, so that you make sure that it's a, a smooth integration now in terms of the policy making and laws and guidelines of course um without the mandate uh, we are risking the the concept of leaving the climate change actions to people's voluntarily uh, uh to people can uh, can voluntarily adopt them and that's a problem if we think about it as a long-term uh, solution, because we've now reached a point in climate change that we need the actions to be mandated um, and we need the decisions to be uh, uh, from policies and from certain regulations, which is why, uh, of course, governments continue to take the decision to enroll in certain protocols and international protocols to combat greenhouse gases like the Montreal Protocol, the Kyoto Protocol, which is um, a lot of uh, international, uh, uh, internationally approved uh, entities are pushing for uh, countries to, to actually um, uh, commit to these policies. So, of course, the policy making side of it is really important. Uh, we need the mandate to come from uh, governments and from governmental institutions in terms of policies, guidelines, and strategies. Of course, each uh, at their own capacity. And uh, when it comes to the level of projects and applying it on projects, you need everyone's um, adoption of the idea, uh, understanding it as a concept of sustainability, which is why raising awareness is the most important uh, the most important factor in applying all these solutions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tasneem. Well, I, to, what can one add to that? Uh, simply this, uh, uh, because, of, because of the state of, uh, of understanding of how to put uh, uh, green roofs and blue green roofs together, it's uh, really, in my opinion, it's really up to the, their implementation, adaptation implementation is really up to having professionals knowledgeable enough to be able to, to, to do that, to put that together and to take the responsibility. Uh, it'll be later on, once the guidelines and standards exist, 
that policy will drive uh, the implementation of those types of structures into urban agglomerations going forward. And uh, lawmakers or those who develop policy for a particular municipality will feel um, much better about uh, enacting uh, support to those types of activities uh, simply because they have the, uh, I should say, the, uh, the infrastructure in place to be able to do it. So you need people to know how to do it and you need, and thereafter those people uh, develop, help develop the, the useful guidelines and standards. And that eventually gets into the building codes. And then these things are adopted much more broadly. But of course, if you were to ask, how soon would that happen all over? Well, we're at the very beginning. So all of you young people out there, keep going. It's great. All very good indeed. Do we have another question? Do we have another? Yes, we do. We do. Okay, and so our, uh, our attendee asks, are nature-based solutions other than green, green roofs included in the green building rating systems? So yeah. we're not talking about uh, green roofs, we're talking about uh, nature-based yeah. solutions. Yes, yes. And so that begs the question, uh, to what extent are nature-based solutions being taken up in uh, green councils? Are they, are they from, from what you know, are, is it well known? Yeah, actually, um, so many recent projects comes to us that require lead, uh, let's say, targeting rate, okay? And one of the rates, or let's say, uh, the mandatory uh, closure, closures to have, for example, one of them, uh, as a case study, one of the projects we used to work on, like 80% of water coming out from this kind of building need to be reused uh, in landscaping areas. So that's like a natural based solution. That is a comprehensive solution within the building itself. And um, it's mandatory to uh, target that uh, lead uh, targeting point they require. So yes, natural based solutions is essential part of um, uh, green building, uh, uh, environmental assessment points. Okay, well, we're sure that well, what we're I guess what we're saying is they, they, they I should say they may not be uh, uh, identified as such, but the elements are there that uh, one can chalk up uh, uh, lead points or whatever, at least in America, uh, for uh, for nature based solutions. It doesn't and it's actually in some of the credits, actually, it is identified as a um, as a as, as an action to combat climate change. So um, yeah. There are some credits in LEED that focus on maintaining and uh, restoring habitats and protecting biodiversity. Yeah. Um, even the concept of native species uh, is also seen in green building rating systems. And if we talk about, for example, the well building standard, we have uh, certain credits in the well building standards that focuses on uh, nature based solutions. The focus of the credit is to uh, apply uh, vegetation to include the concept of biophilic design and biophilia uh, within the built environment. So uh, whether it's vegetation, whether it's some other credit that led to you uh, uh, incorporating a nature-based solution. So if you look at daylighting, for example, and using it, sometimes the intent is the energy saving, uh, but you are actually helping the, the environment and the climate change. Uh, we have uh, one uh, last question before we adjourn. Uh, can uh, this idea be adopted by uh, poor and underdeveloped countries that are facing uh, climate change issues? Um, and, uh, you know, um, what, uh, what would be the challenges uh, to implementing such types of strategies in, uh, in underdeveloped countries? There's a question for it. Actually, um, if we if we are talking about uh, vegetation and green roofs and um, in general the concept of protecting uh, biodiversity and habitats, you you would see it much more in uh, these underdeveloped countries because the developed countries are the ones who have the all the the infrastructure, the buildings, and who need the restoration of the biodiversity in order to combat the effects of it. So in the underdeveloped countries, you would find the, the farms and the, uh, the species that are there uh, are still protected. 
And this is what we need to protect through focusing on um, uh, the policies and the legislation that we can do in the uh, developed countries uh, in order to combat uh, the urbanization effect, let's call it. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And um, uh, to be honest, um, when you say uh, undeveloped countries, um, for example, uh, let's say in Jordan, let's say, which is my home country, the, um, the climate change has an impact on these countries, or let's say in my country, Jordan, uh, in really in unrealistic way, like the past season. And in this season, uh, the high rain intensity was marvelous. So uh, the adaptation of a natural-based solution was one of the main strategies they are looking at nowadays, just to, uh, let's say, um, eliminate the flooding hazards um, coming out uh, from uh, these uh, uh, rainfall events. So it, it differs from region to region, but mainly uh, this region might suffer as well from high uh, rainfall in different uh, intensities that require a strategic solution such as a natural-based solution. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, and so that, uh, so we're, we've reached, uh, thank you very much for those people who have uh, put in uh, uh, questions to the chat. I apologize if we haven't uh, been able to um, uh, to answer all of your questions at this time, but uh, we're going to be moving on to uh, to the end of the program, as it turns out already. Has it po is it possible? Uh, so I, I'd like to thank uh, my co-panelists. I'd like to uh, thank, of course, Reem. Uh, you do uh, very good indeed. I really uh, it was a very excellent presentation, a very detailed presentation, and uh, people will greatly benefit for the in, from the information that you provided in a set of slides. Thank you so much, Rui. Tasneem, Zachary, thank you very much indeed. Uh, <laughs> you have quite a bit of experience in the area that's come through, and uh, uh, you're a huge source of information for the implementation of these solutions. So good to get to know you both. I really enjoyed it. I hope that uh, the people that uh, have been listening and we've had uh, about 30 odd people uh, tune in to us today. Uh, I hope they've uh, benefited from this, uh, from this discussion, from the presentation. I certainly have. I've greatly enjoyed myself. I wish you all well. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, um, can I just... Um... Before we disappear, um, I, I also also want to echo uh, Michael's um, thanks to our speakers, uh, um, to all of you for such an interesting discussion, and also to thank the audience for your participation. Um, we do apologize for the slight technical challenges that we've had, but the presentation will be uh, made available to everyone um, in due course. Um, so as you can see on the screen, the next webinar is titled Future-Proof Workforce in the Construction Industry, Harnessing the Power of Diversity. And more details of this webinar will be communicated to you in due course. So that concludes today's programs. Um, you may now disconnect. Thank you and have a good day. Bye. When do, thank you very much indeed. Thank Greatly you. appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye.